So welcome back. Uh, we have studied the basic three pillars of soft computing. We first studied the neural network that was the first technique used for solving problems. We then studied evolutionary computation which was followed by a uh, discussion over the fuzzy inference system or sometimes referred to as uh, the granular computing. We left in a lot in the evolutionary computing that is what the uh, few lectures from now would aim at. That is all about the evolutionary computing. We will touch upon a topic known as Swarm Intelligence and both of them are well known words. The swarms is nothing but a group of organisms, a group of animals. We have seen multiple swarms all around. A group of flocking birds, that is nothing but a swarm of birds. Fish schools is nothing but a swarm where multiple fishes they live together. We've got all these various swarms that live intact and they help each other to make its living. Now the big question is that can we make use of some properties that they exhibit? Say a group of flocking birds. Is there something that a group of flocking birds are able to get their daily meals get in a benefit by staying together in living and if it is, if it helps them can we have similar things into our artificial systems as well? Can we model our artificial systems based on these lines of swarms so as to get extra benefit from the collective intelligence of all the members that reside inside this swarm? The other important word is intelligence over here. Now because these are group, they collectively hold a lot of intelligence. And of course we are studying the basic pattern of artificial law, the computational intelligence and the word intelligence is very dear to us. Because of this intelligence that they possess, not individually alone, but as well as as a group, these are able to accomplish some kinds of tasks. These are able to accomplish some kind of tasks. So the entire paradigm of swarm intelligence that comprises of a lot many algorithms including the genetic algorithm, the entire paradigm of swarm intelligence relies upon the fact how is it that we can make use of this intelligence that exists in swarms into our artificial systems, can we develop systems based on the same lines and get some extra benefit that is probably benefiting the everyday living of all the members of these swarms. So again there are numerous algorithms that we would be studying and we will take in a few algorithms one after the other. The first two algorithms, the first algorithm that we study out over here is known as the particle swarm optimization. Now because it is evolutionary in nature, there will be some kind of optimization that we will actually be performing. So again you are referred to what we discussed it way backward as the optimization space wherein I drew in nice curves and the intention was to maximize the fitness or to minimize the cost. That was the, the uh, basic uh, kind of motivation to find out the best points inside this fitness landscape, inside the cost landscape or in this optimization space. Again, it's a swarm technique to be used. Now, particle swarm optimization is an inspiration from the group of flocking birds. There is a habitat, there is a location and all these birds they live together, they flock together in search of some kind of food. Now what eventually happens is that every bird has its own knowledge, it knows something about itself, it knows what all places it has visited, what all kinds of terrains it has visited, what all can be worse found over those places. 
it has complete knowledge of all these things. What additionally it has knowledge about is the global coordinating system where it shares its knowledge with the other birds and the other birds they share their knowledge with itself. As a result, anything interesting that this bird finds, it's uh, transmitted to the entire swarm. All the members get to know about it and they are benefit from that extra information. And whatever other birds find, they inform this bird. So as a result, there is an information pool that is available. There is a collective intelligence that is available. There is an entire group of intelligence that is available. This intelligence helps every bird find food for itself. This is the intelligence that helps every bird find out some or the other source of food for itself. Now into our optimization problem, we use the same kind of inspiration from the nature and biologically inspired world. We use the same kind of inspiration and we induce this intelligence into the artificial systems that we would be developing. We would be seeing into how we can use this inspiration from the basic flocking birds into our artificial systems. So even before we start off, let me first say that there was a problem and let me again assume because we have discussed multiple times that the optimization space is available. I am drawing the fitness landscape so that would be something like this in nature. Where this is a highly dimensional space over here somewhere at the base and the fitness value is right at the top. My intention is to find out the global maxima and to escape from all the local maxima. Again, what we would be taking in a multi-agent approach, so there would be a set of agents over here. These agents are nothing but they are called in this case as the particles. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, and six. I've got some six particles in this entire search space. I've got some six particles in this entire search space and what they are doing is to search in for the global maxima that resides somewhere around here. Now based on the same kind of discussions that we had with the genetic algorithm, we can even say that I can draw in the base of this curve, I can represent it somewhere like this, where these will represent the various particles. I am disregarding the vertical sphere and drawing on this surface over here where this is the position landscape any particle over here or over here it has a position which is nothing but this location over here it has a position Plus, it has a fitness value, which is nothing but this value. This we get it straight away from the genetic algorithms. Every particle will ultimately have a position and it will have a fitness value. In genetic algorithm, we apply some very difficult uh, crossover and mutation kind of uh, operators here we will not be doing that we will assume these particles are not static but rather they are moving these are not static but all these particles are moving somewhere and they keep on walking they keep on uh, walking in this fitness landscape or in this position landscape they keep on walking in search of a global minima they are always walking with a velocity so 
So that is the third thing that uh, any particle has a velocity. Now the fitness value is nothing but the real number, it's the physical value of the fitness that you have. Position is a vector. So let me say if my optimization problem was n dimensional, position would be nothing but p1, p2 up to pn. Similarly, velocity is a vector. So my velocity vector will be there will be one variant at each of the axis. So it will be some v1, v2 up to vn. So as a result, what happens is that for any particle i, I have a position vector pi. a velocity vector a fitness value the entire genetic algorithm operated in some kind of generations similarly this algorithm will operate in an iterative manner, there will be some kind of iterations that I would apply. At every iteration, every particle gets in one chance to move. At every iteration, every particle would get one chance to move. The particle will move by a magnitude of their velocity. So if the velocity is very high, the particles will take in bigger steps. If the velocity is very small, the particles will take in very small steps. A step in this case denotes how much it is able to move in this space over here or how much it is able to move uh, in this landscape over here. That is, what, uh, that is what a step would denote. How much is a particle able to move at one unit of time or at one iteration. So what happens is that initially I take in a randomized approach. Initially I take in a very randomized approach where all the various particles are located at distinctive regions in this fitness landscape. Because they are located at different regions in this fitness landscape, it is assumed that I already have a fitness qualifying criteria with me. I already have in a fitness function with me so I can find out what their fitness is and since I can find out their fitness I even, even randomly assign them some kind of velocities now these are all the various particles that have got some velocity, some position, some fitness value assigned randomly towards the start of the algorithm so at any time, the first thing that I need to do, I need to move the particles in this fitness landscape depending upon the velocity. So I take every particle and I move it in this fitness landscape. So I say P, the vector I at any time T plus 1 would be equal to the position vector of the particle I at time T plus its velocity vector now the velocity is not constant it's all changing with time so the position of any particle that is modified by the magnitude of velocity at any iteration this I do for all the various particles around this I do all the various particles around now because it's already assumed the particles are moving as per some velocity so this is what is the first step applied to move the particles at any iteration. So it looks uh, too many technical disturbance here and there. What we were discussing is that there is a position with a particle and I am going to update it as per its velocity. So this velocity is nothing but the amount of space that this particle traverses in one iteration of time. That's why you see that I have straight away I added up this also an n-dimension vector, this also an n-dimension vector. What together they give me after addition is 
the position at any time t plus 1 or at any iteration t plus 1. Now, this was the fundamental of the position vectors and the, uh, the uh, and they being updated as per the velocity. But the main crux of the particle swarm optimization is that how can I modify this velocity so that the particle always preferably walks towards the global minimum. So that all the particles they walk towards the global minima and probably at some point of time they all converge up at the global minima. A phenomena that we saw was happening beautifully when we talk about the genetic algorithm where towards the end all the particles they actually converge towards the global minima. So I am going to devise a strategy in which this velocity of the particle can be modified. It can be modified in such a way that the particles they converge at a global minima because if this is the velocity, initial position, this is the velocity, so at any point of time the particle at one iteration of time will jump from here to here. I need to modify this velocity in such a way such that it points towards the global minima such that next time it jumps over here, next time it jumps over here and consequently it converges up towards a local minima, uh, towards a global minima. The unfortunate fact is that I have some idea regarding all the various velocities enjoyed by all the various particles. I have some idea regarding all the various velocities enjoyed by all the various particles. I know their fitness value but I do not know where this global minima lies. So I have no idea regarding where the global minima lies. What is more that I do not even know where the global minima lies. This is when we are talking about the uh, cost landscape because I got a uh, fitness landscape we do not know where the global maxima lies and we have no idea regarding where the local maxima lies. So we make in a kind of prediction, we make in a kind of prediction that the local maxima or the local optima will lie at a position that enjoys the best fitness value as per the walk of the individual particle so far. We will say that while the particle is travelling, while it keeps on travelling, it keeps on memorizing the best area, the best fitness that it has received so far. It keeps on memorizing this position which is the best position where it has received so far, the best fitness value that it has received so far. Based on that, we assume that uh, this gives us some idea of the local minima of uh, let's say the global maxima. So if this was the particle, it probably went, would have gone somewhere from here to here, somewhere from here to here. And like this, it would have travelled in multiple times at multiple places. We say that it keeps on memorizing what is the best fitness value it has received so far. It keeps on memorizing this. And since it keeps on memorizing the best fitness value, it assumes that the local maxima is somewhere that the best value that it has received so far. And we say that the global Maxima would be nothing but the best fitness received so far by all the ants, by all the particles. So this is the best fitness of ith particle and this is the best fitness of all the particles combined. So this is that every particle, it keeps one position with itself, it keeps one fitness value with itself, that is the best fitness that it has received so far in its entire journey. And this, the global maxima, we assume that it is the best fitness that it has received in by any ant in any of their entire journey. This is what is kept locally by any particle and this is what is globally shared among all the particles. 
So this is what carries on some coordination fundamental and this is what it, uh, uh, every ant keeps for itself. And of course all the local maximas are shared among the various ants and then every, uh, by the various particles and then the every particle it computes the global maxima and that is common for all the various uh, particles existing in this form. So we have introduced two more concepts over here. The first, first is the best fitness of the i particle. Let me say this is PBI. And the global best fitness, let me say PG, I do not need any notation I since this is common for all the ants of this form. This is a global variable that we have in our entire algorithm. So now the underlying question again comes up in how can I modify the particle velocity such that it always traverses towards the global minima. One way would be simple that uh, okay that uh, I know that the, uh, approximately PG is the global minima so all the uh, particle space walk towards the global minima. I modify the velocity in such a way but then again it is only an approximation that uh, the global minima exists here. It's only an approximation that the global minima exists here. We can never be sure. Towards the starting, all the particles are randomly placed. Towards the starting, all the particles are at random location. Some are good, some are bad. We cannot say that the global minima is the best position occupied by the best particle. In fact, we cannot even say that it is the best position near around uh, the global minima maxima lies around the position where the best particle is located we can never be sure of anything like that so what we ideally do is that we make the and we make the particles have two kind of fundamentals we make the particles have two kinds of fundamentals by one fundamental principle they try to converge in their local maxima by one principle they try to go inside their global maxima that is some kind of exploration that they are trying to producing in and around the areas in which they are operating so if this is the area that a particle is operating it tries to explore this area by this fundamental principle in which it tries to move in such a way so as to converge right inside the local maxima but then we know that if we do it all the particles will this particle will lie over here towards the end this particle will lie over here this particle will lie over here this particle will reach here this particle will reach here and we may get a global maxima we may not get a global maxima and a lot of computation is uh, wasted in having been trying to find out multiple multiple maxima because an uh, actual fitness landscape would have too many uh, local maximas and of course only one global minima uh, global maxima if the global representation is not redundant so we've got multiple particles firstly they try to explore the area and try to find out the best place so as to give the algorithm best idea of the kind of place they are operating on the second fundamental is that they always try to go towards the global maxima. They always try to go towards the global maxima. Now why this is important? Because towards the end we need some kind of convergence where all the particles meet and they meet in only when they all commonly decide to go towards one specific location and that is by this quadratic principle in which they are tempted to move towards the global maxima. What the search of local maxima says is that it tries to con con uh, uncover more and more candidates of the global maxima. It tries to uncover more and more places that are better than the place we got so far. As a result, this global maxima is recorded by multiple ants at, uh, by multiple particles at multiple stages of time. Towards the tenth iteration, and number five, particle number five may say that I am at the best position recorded any time so far. But after ten iterations. In search of a local minima or in during its entire walk towards the global, uh, global ma uh, maxima and number 7 may suddenly come across a region that has an even higher fitness value and that is when it will give a call to all the various particles all around that now I am at the best position now you all try to uh, uh, come to a position in which I am standing. 
So that is what comes up with the concept of local and local maxima. The equation would be very simple. The equation would just say that velocity of the particle i at time t plus 1 is nothing but velocity at time i at time t, we'll discuss the third parameter a little later, plus c1 times a random number r, the position vector of the uh, particle minus the, uh, it's intended to move towards the local maxima, so we'll subtract in the two, uh, we'll subtract in the two vectors and we'll find out the direction vector that points towards this location, so we'll have the position vector of p i minus the local best for this particular case. Now it's local best, so I'm introducing this uh, subscript notation plus c2 r position vector minus the global vector. This common follow. Now unfortunately when we go about with these two fundamental uh, factors, if we go about with these two fundamental factors, there might be too many changes of the velocity vector. So there is a historical parameter that is added, which tries to lure the particle to walk in the, to the same direction, which try, kind of lures the particle to walk into the same direction as it was following in the history. So these are the three guiding principles that every particle considers during its motion. The historical parameter, the intention to go into a local maxima, that is its historical, uh, that is whatever best position it has formed in the history and the global maxima recorded so far. And that is how the entire part uh, moves. Now the best vector also can change at the later stage of time and the global vector can also change at the later uh, stages of time. So based on this, I write down in a general algorithm for the particle swarm optimization. The algorithm would just say that I initialize the position vectors, randomly, I initialize the velocity vectors. Initially, I have only one vector, so I have no choice to decide the local best. I'll have to assume that this is the local best. I find out the global vector. So whatever vector gives me the maximum fitness, that I uh, have it as the global vector. I say while stopping criterion is not met. Again, not to discuss the stopping criterion because the stopping criterion ultimately have the same kinds of uh, fundamentals that we had. I do only one thing. I say vi equals to. I will update the position vector. I'll update the velocity. C1 R position vector at time t minus the local best PV at time t for the right particle plus C2 R position vector at time t minus the global Then I compute the local best. Then I compute the global best. And that's how the loop can be. So I think will be same as for the genetic algorithm. All these criteria can be uh, mentioned over here. The important factor is that we have added some kind of randomization over here. And C1 and C2 are constants where uh, C1 and C2 are anywhere between 0 to 1. Those are used to control the amount of uh, variation in velocity that is possible. Now we have got three factors. 
C1 there was a contribution of the position uh, of the intention to go into the uh, local minima C2 can controls the intent, uh, how much intention does a particle have to go into towards a global minima and this is the historical parameter sometimes this can also be suffixed by a uh, constant to control how much historical information that we are carrying R is only to give some kind of randomness in the algorithm to have a chance to explore it up to varying degree now remember that too high at exploration may sometimes over jump the uh, maxima to less exploration may take a lot of time to converge into the maxima so all these are controlled by the vector r that is of uh, any random number one thing again that uh, it's important to discuss that vi is always restricted to any velocity vmax i will not allow my velocity to cross vmax i will always restrict it at every domain to a maximum velocity vmax now what happens is that sometimes when the global maxima is too far and its contribution is very high or maybe sometimes the global maxima gets too far the particle is likely to attain very high velocities now when a particle it has very high velocity suppose it was here a very high velocity means it will take a big jump and it will reach up over reach up over here similar to uh, oscillation in terms of back propagation algorithm next time if it is in this direction it might reach up somewhere over here if the global maxima is still forward it might reach up somewhere even forward in this case what has happened is that in its search in its search the particle completely overcrossed the maxima that was to be found here it completely overshooted because of a very high velocity so therefore we restrict the maximum velocity to certain limit so that this high velocity vector can never change take in a very high magnitude it always has to take in a considerable magnitude of work it can always work decently it cannot take just jump up across the fitness landscape because jumping would means random box you can be found at any location in the entire complex fitness landscape where the land fitness value at any location it cannot be determined now again we have a v max over here if i keep this value very high if i keep this value very high all the particles would be allowed to take in high values and that's why they all be hopping in and around and that is when overshooting would be possible so this parameter can only fix to very high but on the other contrary if the v max is very low even small jumps will not be permitted a jump from here to here will not be permitted because v max might be only this so particle will have to walk down slowly and slowly towards the maxima over here and that is when the algorithm will show a very very slow convergence it will show a very very slow exploration and that is why the entire algorithm kind of suffers so that's why we do not fix in very high or very low values to the parameter v max i'll go over with the algorithm into a fitness landscape it can be easily seen if this was the fitness landscape a global maxima over here multiple particles here and there and the corresponding particles here and there initially they all random initially they all are random positions so they all try to move towards a local maxima that is as per the drawn arrows over here and the global maxima that is in this case i'll assume this to be slightly higher this so they all have an intention to move somewhere over here they hop this particle comes up over here this particle comes up over here this comes up over here this comes up over here this is this thing as it is let's say and this comes up uh, slightly above over here 
it comes up over here, it comes up over here, it comes up over here. Next time again, this is believed to be highest. So they'll all walk a little bit towards the side and a little bit towards the side. After a few generations, what will happen is this particle will reach over here, this particle will reach over here. That is when this fitness is higher than this fitness. That is why this becomes a global maxima and then all the particles will move towards a local minima over here as well as towards this local minima over here. When they all reach up these points, there will be a global attraction by this particle. This will stay, uh, this will walk in and around. There will be a global attraction where all the particles will be attracted towards here. So, so after some time this particle hops, after some time this particle hops, after some time this leaves its local minima over here, it hops in, so, uh, in attempt to get the global maxima that is where the C2 causes the C1. The C2 becomes more dominant than C1 and that is when the particles they start leaving their local minimas and they start uh, going towards a global minima. Earlier we uh, contradicted that the particles were intending to move uh, towards the lo uh, local minimas that's when the C1 was uh, dominating C2 now they are trying to move towards the global minima over here and eventually towards the end all the particles will be here trying to move around. And let's say this particle is still over here, sometimes this particle will stop, now this will become the global minima. This particle will follow this particle and ultimately they will converge it in the, this region, there will be an absolute convergence. I am not dealing with the entire discussion that uh, more or less follows the same uh, norms as per the genetic algorithm. Now again because we are discussing an evolutionary computing technique, we need to be very sure about something known as exploration versus exploitation. What exploration it states is that if the particle tries to locate new regions in the fitness landscape, now because it does that, there is one thing good and one thing bad. The good thing is that it's more likely to be found at regions near the global minima, it is more exploring, so it will ultimately be, uh, it might try to go towards some uh, near about uh, the global maxima. But what's bad is that there will be no convergence. All the particles may not meet, they are more exploratory in nature. That's why we, in genetic algorithm we said that such space is con expanding instead of contracting. So a uh, hunt for global maxima is what is exploration, but then there is no convergence. It might be that the particles are here and here, they are so close towards the global maxima, but then after that for exploration they go all at random directions. Exploitation is where a particle tries to converge deep inside and it probably can converge into a local maxima, that is the negative part, but then convergence is very good. So if it's anywhere in this vicinity, it will ultimately get converged towards this point and it will give exactly the point where the maxima lies. Any evolutionary computing technique will have to balance both of these. It will have to balance exploration and with exploitation. Too much of exploration is bad, no convergence. Too much of exploitation is bad, convergence is into a local maxima. Too less uh, exploration is bad, convergence into local maxima. Too less uh, exploitation is bad, too much of exploration that means too much of uh, no convergence at all. So that is what happens ultimately in case of a particle swarm optimization. That was the first form intelligence technique that we took up in this hour of lecture. I'll briefly take in another technique over here. What is known as the ad colony optimization. sometimes even referred to as the ACO. The particles optimization is referred by the PSO, this is referred by the ACO. What and colony optimization is, it is mainly a graph searching technique. So we have some kind of graph available, we assume that. all these various things possible. So we have some kind of graph available. This is the source, this is the goal. 
my problem is to using an evolutionary computing kind of thing, using a swarm intelligence kind of thing, move, try to find out the shortest path from the source to the goal. Trying to find out what is the shortest path to the source to the goal. Here what do we do? We take in an analogy from the ants. We take in an analogy from the ants. It is well known that if there is something dropped, uh, there is something to it, so all the ants they collectively come together and they go away and they converge at that point. All the ants come up collectively and they carry out all the tasks along with that food item. So we are trying to take that inspiration if we can do that. Now how do many ants uh, coordinate is something very interesting. An ant, it explores some kind of food, it tries to explore some kind of food and as it explores this food, it leaves some kind of chemicals known as pheromones. It leaves in some kind of chemicals known as pheromones in its past. So whatever ants comes after this, it can sense these pheromones and it can come to know about the path that it is following. It can have some kind of idea about uh, what kind of path it is following, what kind of what do we expect out of it. So these pheromones are the kind of coordinating body when it comes towards the ants. These pheromones any ant leaving the pheromone is an indication to the ants that come after it how to find out the food item. If it's find out the food item uh, based on the pheromones and its traits, it will be able to follow this up. So what happens here, we, have, we leave multiple ants from the source and we tell them all that you reach the goal out over here. We leave multiple ants and we tell all these ants to reach the goal out here. Now what was called as the or the particle in a particle swarm optimization an individual here would be called as an ant over here. An individual would be called up as the ant over here. Now we left multiple ants all more or less randomly or by any technique they reach up the goal over here. Some of them may eventually more not even reach the goal. We apply a threshold that uh, even after a lot of try attempt, if you do not reach the goal, surrender. So based on that, they reach in these goals over here. Now what happens is that once an ant reaches its goal, it tries to leave in some chemicals over the edges. It tries to leave in some pheromones over the edges over the path that it followed to reach the goal. So let me say that there was an ant that took out this route. Over here, what it would do is that it will leave some chemicals at this place, some chemicals at this place, some chemicals at this place and the entire route that it had followed. It will leave some chemicals over here. These chemicals are of course the pheromones from the biological analogy. Every ant reaching the goal, it goes and leaves some chemicals over the path that it had used to reach to the goal. Once it reaches the goal, uh, the magnitude of chemical that is deposited by the ant is directly proportional to the goodness of the path. So let me say that the amount of pheromone is directly proportional to how good the path is. If I had to find out the shortest path, the ant reaching at very short path, reaching by a very short path will leave in high amount of pheromone and uh, uh, and that leaves a very long path and somehow reach the goal it will uh, leave very 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 small amount of pheromones in its entire path. Now what these pheromones do is that next time I send up ant from the source from here. Next time I send the ants from the source from here, they would again try to reach the goal but then they would already be directed by the paths followed by the earlier ants. They would be directed by the paths because 
they earns only some amount of few mole that is deposited in the parts so they have uh, some kind of idea regarding the parts that they earlier earned stock and because the few mole is directly proportional to the value of the part the goodness of that part that is why they have some idea regarding how good that edge is regarding how good that part is so there are some terminologies that i am going to quickly introduce to the first is that edge so let me say an edge e i j there would be an and those are the basic uh, fundamental thing that we are studying the basic uh, problem solving particles what i will do is that i will read some ands over here they reach the goal again i will reach uh, i will uh, leave some ands here they again reach the goal i'll again uh, leave some ands they again reach the goal and towards the end i will see is that the parts that the ands take to reach the goal it keeps on improving along with time it keeps on improving along with time there will be something known as a fitness of a part that denotes its goodness Now, from this basic fundamental that I'm leaving and that they are leaving out over here, and my intention is that this part keeps on improving along with time, I will introduce you to another thing that is the strategy by which the particles move. There's a strategy by which any ant over here moves. So let me say that this there's an ant I that is exploring its part over here from here. It keeps on walking. it is at any edge over here i need to devise a strategy regarding the next step that an ant will take i'm going to devise a strategy that this ant will take next and once i get devise a strategy that this ant will uh, using which this ant moves i'll repeat this uh, strategy for all the movements of this ant and replicate it to all the other ants and this thing when i try to over and over again gives me the complete algorithm so what is the strategy by which an ant i located let's say at node j all these uh, what this is are let's say nothing but nodes at j it moves when what strategy do it doesn't moves now because it's again uh, i'll take it a kind of uh, probabilistic approach any ant over here considers two factors by which it moves the first is known as attractiveness the other is known as traits it considers these two factors in making a decision what which edge should it take next which movement should it make next it considers these two factors the first factor attractiveness that states try to take the position which makes you reach as close as possible to the goal so it is some kind of heuristic technique which is all the by some intelligent technique devised into the algorithm similar to the heuristics in asa algorithm and the heuristic search attractiveness attractiveness is nothing but this kind of heuristics where it tries to make in the best possible moves there is an attempt to make in the best possible move by every ant it tries to make in the best uh, uh, movement that will make it reach as close as possible to the goal again because heuristics is never well defined heuristics cannot be guaranteed only the historical cost can be guaranteed the heuristics are never be guaranteed so there is a chance that it reaches near the goal there is a chance that it does not reach near the goal but there is an attempt to reach as close as possible based on these preset heuristics that the attractiveness says what traits said says is that it measures the amount of pheromone it measures the pheromonic content if the pheromonic content is very high it states that i am more likely this part was used by multiple ants and all of them must have had good fitness value of the part generated using this edge and therefore i must use this edge and therefore i must uh, kind of use this edge in my part so 
attractive traits is nothing but and ants get attracted when the pheromonic content is very high a high pheromonic content is in some measure is in some degree a measure of how good that it is as decided by the earlier ants as experienced by the earlier ants so that is what is traits so i say that the probability p that any ant i takes in an edge j or j i only use it for the note probability that any i ant i from the location j uses the edge k the probability that any ant i from the uh, location j uses the possible edge k is equal to summation of two factors that is traits plus attractiveness this can be equated to two terms that we introduce out over here d pheromonic value of this uh, edge the pheromonic value of this edge that starts from location node j and the edge k the k edge from there that starts from location j k plus its heuristic value and this i normalize it because it's a popular uh, it's a kind of probabilistic approach i normalize it over the entire for all ants so this is what denotes my probability that the ant ant will take in at node j will take in the kate path that's what the probability i computed to be and again it can be said is that based on this reading i can well say that it's a probabilistic approach so i'll have some kind of selection criteria similar to that used in uh, genetic algorithm based on this probabilistic distribution i'll have some kind of selection technique be it tournament selection be it roulette wheel selection be it stochastic uniform selection i'll select in one path that this ant takes in next and i'll execute this path for this ant so this is how an ant moves from the source to the goal if it reaches the goal if it does not reaches the goal it's completely vanish if it reaches the goal this is how it moves based on all these probabilities initially all edges have a trait value of 0 and the attractiveness is of course as per calculated cost initially all the traits are zero what happens after it reaches this goal over here it goes to all these edges and it deposits some kind of pheromones it will have that needs to deposit some pheromones so basically for any jk my pheromonic content will change so at t plus 1 it will be the pheromone that was only there is there intact that one amount of pheromone is only there with this uh, edge so let me say that this was the node j and this is the first edge this is the uh, this is the k edge over here the pheromone will change by some amount that is depending upon how much uh, amount uh, how much more pheromone has to be deposited on it now this delta tau jk is defined by a summation of delta tau jk for all ants a to calculate how much after all the ants have reached over here i need to calculate how much amount each ant has deposited so based on that i need to find out uh, so in order to compute this i will try to find out how much has the first ant deposited how much has the second ant deposited how much has the third ant deposited how much has the fourth ant deposited and like this how much has the fifth ant deposited i'll summation it up over all the ants in my system so it's like after 10 ants reach from here to here the first ant 
reaches this part, or all these parts and deposit something, the second hand uses this part to deposit something. So while I am considering any edge over here, I am seeing how many ants they pass through it and I am adding the pheromonic content deposited by all these ants individually. I am trying to see how much each of these ants deposited individually, so I am summation over all the A and delta tau j k for any ant A is nothing but a fixed value q. If ant A uses j k h in its path, zero otherwise. So if it's used it's, it's h, I add some value q over here, where q can be nothing but it can be said as q is directly proportional towards the fitness value of the path used by the sun. So I see the goodness of the path, all the ants they deposit something in their paths and for any edge I calculate the new value. What it unfortunately leads to that this parameter tau jk at any time t plus 1 it rises indefinitely. There will be 100 generation and it will keep on increasing, it will keep on increasing. So with time we subtract some parameter from it. We subtract some kind of uh, parameter from it along with time. So it will, uh, this is so that the paths will not over, uh, the, to get uh, overfilled with the pheromones, so we evaporate some kind of pheromones from them. As per time, as the paths move, we deposit some kind of pheromones there. And normally another parameter is added than alpha and beta here, when alpha and beta are nothing but between 0 and 1. So based on this, I can add down two things, move that from here to here and we deposit the pheromonic content. The actual analysis of how these uh, uh, particles of optimization works uh, at ACO works, Along with the actual algorithm, we'll discuss it in the next. Uh